All right. Welcome to uh, what I think will likely be one of the last episodes of this tutorial series. Uh, in this one, I wanted to talk briefly about how I went through the actual process of optimizing this frame, um, as well as kind of some of the constraints that I worked with, as well as kind of what I would have done if those constraints may not have been there. Um, so let's start from the top. So basically what this is, this is Parks Racing 3, uh, I'm sorry, par Parks Racing 4, the fork's fourth car that will have been built by Parks Racing. Um, and this is kind of uh, one of the, I think this is the third iteration of this particular chassis design uh, that is kind of this general roll hoop location, engine type, and differential box assembly are kind of some of the key features. Um, another Another big part of it that we really pride ourselves on is this underbody gondola where we put our actual suspension. Um, I believe that's kind of a brief summary of that. Okay, so when I asked to redesign this chassis, uh, there was some initial concern about um, about you know changing something that already worked and uh, wouldn't necessarily have that much benefit because there was a, a pretty pretty strong argument for just keeping things as consistent as they could be given our constraints of team size and funding and whatnot. Um, I went ahead and kind of pushed and tried to make as many changes as I could without, you know, altering the design to the point of, of making a completely new frame. Uh, and the way I went about doing that was starting in the middle of the frame and then working to the front and then to the back. And in each case, I looked at, you know, well, what fundamentally do we like about that design? What do we want to keep the same and why? And then what tube sizes can I, you know, what, A, what tubes can be gotten rid of completely? And then what tube sizes can be brought down? And how can we not compromise the performance of the chassis? Obviously, both in terms of safety and in terms of uh, on-track performance, in terms of torsional rigidity being our primary metric. Um, so again, uh, the way I the way I kind of bit it off into bite-sized chunks was starting with the middle, optimizing all those tubes, then moving to the front, kind of figuring out what the geometry would be in a couple iterations, and then figuring out what the tube sizes would be in a couple iterations, and then the same for the rear, although that did get cut short by the current global uh, scenario. Um, I want to mention that a couple things I would like to mention. Okay. So, um, looking at the structural equivalency spreadsheet, um, okay, so say you're watching this and you're designing the next frame. Um, you know, that, that, could that could mean anything from being asked to make my design a little lighter, which it absolutely could be, or uh, being asked to design a new one from the ground up. Um, I'd mention a couple things. Number one, um, there does not need to be three horizontal tubes in this center section. Let me go into here and make it not transparent. Okay. There does not need to be three center tubes in this section. Um, these, this, so this, one, two, three. Um, these, in our current design, uh, it's meant to kind of have these comply with the side impact structure rule and then have another one down here. With with the more recent rules, uh, they actually want the side impact structures to be far farther apart like this. Uh, so it would actually be a pretty straightforward task to make the this bottom frame rail the lower side impact structure. The only reason that can't be done on this design uh, is because the frame rails are too close together at the bottom. Um, there are plenty of workarounds to this. Uh, the seat back would need to be a little wider. Uh, the, this would need to splay out a little further. Uh, this hoop here could not come in at the bottom. Sorry for eclectic rotation. This tube couldn't actually come in at the bottom. It would more have to go straight down. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, though, because that bottom could be an aerodynamic surface. Um, you know, it would save you a lot of weight because right now there are really three or four major load paths that go through the front and middle of this frame. You got one down here that supports, you know, the seat back uh the 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 bottom of the roll hoops both the main hoops the main hoop and the driver hoop they call it as well as the bottom set of suspension points uh, you have this middle one that supports the front uh bulkhead 
kind of goes in between and misses the suspension points and then catches the, the driver hoop is the bottom uh, or sorry the lower side impact structure and then hits the main hoop you've got kind of one right here that comes from these and then goes up here and has this the upper impact structure and that catches the top suspension uh, what I would advise somebody who's designing another chassis to do is really look at the um, look at a past designs that we've had uh, you know kind of learning from especially this one uh, B looking at what other teams have done and C I, I think the the rule book can be a little can be a little vague just looking at words for geometric designs but the uh, these uh, what do they call it the structural equivalency spreadsheet or SES has some really 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 good pictures that I wish I had figured out existed earlier just because it really helped me understand you know what the rules were talking about because when it talks about load paths in the rule book I actually kind of got dinged a couple points at one of the design competitions because I wasn't really actually familiar with what that meant but once I looked at the structural equivalency spreadsheet it made a lot more sense and it would have helped me a lot um, so if I had to recommend here, uh, see if I can, let's do this. This is going to be a really poor drawing, so I forgive me in advance. But, you know, you could get away with one, two primary load paths. And this would, uh, this would pass... This would a this would pass the side impact structure because you'd have your bottom you have your bottom uh, side impact structure and your upper side impact structure. Here you you'd catch your suspension points. Um, you all you would have to do is triangulate the area between it uh, to comply with the to comply with the rule regarding. Um, to comply with the rule regarding um, uh, forgive my I'm having a brain fart you would have to uh, triangulate this to comply with the rule that has uh, the front bulkhead bracing triangulation so this would be your front bulkhead if you wanted to keep it the same this could be moved up or down um, and you'd obviously still have to do this support here that one you'd still have to do the support here nothing wrong with that and then it would have to be triangulated down here that would be a rule required tube but then these would be the only rule required tubes there's just like right now there's a lot of rule required tubes because of you know we, we kind of did the suspension points and then and then already had pre-existing idea of where we wanted the side impact structure and then went and added all the rule required tubes and i think i think that kind of making kind of making all those decisions in one step all together would really help eliminate a lot of these tubes that are not necessary because right now let's see let's see, actually use a highlighter here this one this one this one uh all these all that all these and all that are all rule required and i think that you could probably eliminate oh wait I forgot a couple. Let's see. I think you could probably eliminate, you know, a lot of these. I think, you know, if this one was down here, this one was down here instead, uh, then you could eliminate, you know, this one, this one, and this one. It's just a lot of really dense tubes all in one area that probably could be rethought. That's not saying that this is a bad design. It's, it's, it's proved its worth. Um, I think it's just the reason it's a little dense here is because uh, the, this floor was kind of the main thought. And then, oh, wait, we also need to tie it into the, to the floor. Okay, so we got to add another tube. Okay, wait, it's got a triangle. It's like it ju you just end up with a whole bunch of tubes that are all, um, that are all really dense. So kind of in summary here, let me just kind of clean this up. In summary here. You know, even if you, there's a completely different rethought chassis design, I still think the main thing applies. You know, you, the most important thing about a race car is the tires. So you have to support the suspension loads. That's critical. Those are going to be some of your main load inputs, uh, especially when you're doing your simulation. However, what I've found is through doing some simulation, you know, 
the rule required tubes are going to be way thicker than what is required by your suspension loads. So what that means is if, if we put our upper side impact structure here and the lower one down here at the bottom, you'd have to move the bottom frame rails out, but that means you've already eliminated a tube or two or three or four. So you've got one load path here. So that gets, that gets a rule required tube and supports your suspension points. Okay, that's a rule required tube and supports, supports suspension points. And now it's all triangulated. So this is all your rule required tubes right here. So all th this floor right here could be only as thick as it is needed to hold up the driver's feet, which really you could do with some pretty thin sheet metal supports. Um, you know, if you wanted to mount your suspension in the middle here, then yes, you'd have to you'd have to think about how to make that thicker. But you could do that all really locally. Um, I don't want to ramble on too long about this, but essentially my advice is sit down and kind of think about all your constraints to get everyone to do it together at once, uh, and don't necessarily feel afraid to. Um, to throw out a good amount of an existing design. You don't necessarily have to keep it just for the sake of keeping it. Uh, it's, it's okay to be cautious of changing too much, but uh, especially if you can get rid of a lot of tubes and data can support that it can be safe and strong, uh, then you know that's good. And if there are concerns about safety, if it complies with the FSAE rules, it is safe. Um, they make really sure that the rule, that the tube sizes that they pick out are more than safe enough for any sort of collision. Um, as far as packaging the engine, our existing design is not bad. Um, but again, you could get rid of a couple of these tubes. Right, The rules say it has to be tied into the side impact structure and into the bottom of the frame rail. And it, you could do that. You could eliminate a couple of these tubes if these were combined into one. Uh, the differential housing, I really like the design. It's a really neat way of packaging it all. Uh, that could probably use another couple iterations of smart people attacking it with some software. Uh, that was one of the past projects I did. Uh, I don't necessarily know if I did the best job. Uh, I was a little inexperienced at the time. But it is a lot lighter than it used to be, and it's plenty strong. But if somebody went back with some uh, topological optimization software or even just another round of... Uh, it's pretty simple, straightforward FEA. Uh, that would definitely be something that could lose a lot of weight. And there was an attempt at the end of 2020, uh, so right before Michigan 2020 that got canceled, there was talk of redesigning that again using thinner sheet metal. Um, hopefully that gets done because the current design is probably a little bigger than it needs to be, but again, very functional. Um, I think that's all I have for now. Uh, I will make an addition to this video if anything else comes to me, but uh, I will. You feel free to find a way to contact me. My name is Carl Lemkul. Um, you can try to comment on the YouTube channel. Oh, I can't imagine I'll be monitoring that. A uh, more reliable way would be through my email, which I will give to people in, uh, at Parks Racing. I'll make sure there's a way to contact me. Um, I'm no expert, but if you're looking and you have questions on where to go, if you were assigned to design a new frame, uh, I, I would love to talk to you and uh, give you some pointers and maybe point you in the direction of some people that would know more than I do about specific simulation types. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching. I really hope this helped and have a great rest of your day.